where I end up. So instead of, instead of knowing that 75% of the time the wind will blow me right and 25% of the time the wind will blow me left, I'm just going to randomly sample something from the environment. I'm going to be like, oh, look, I got blown right on this occasion. And I'm going to learn from that sample, just like we do when we interact with the real world. So we sample a next state. If we're in some state S, comma A, I'm going to sample the next state, and I'm going to sample the reward from the model. And then I'm just going to apply our familiar model-free reinforcement learning to those samples. We know how to learn from sample trajectories. We know how to learn from samples where I've just randomly seen what happens if I interact with my environment, and, and the wind blows me around, and I take this whole sequence of actions, and I end up over here, and I get some sequence of rewards. That's the problem we've been studying all along, which is model-free reinforcement. So the main idea here of sample-based planning is to just use the model to generate samples and then to apply model-free reinforcement learning to these samples. Another way to think of that is that the agent has some model in its head. It imagines what is going to happen next. And it plans by solving for its imagined world. It's, it simulates experience. It, I'm imagining, you know, so instead of actually walking ahead, I'm going to imagine you know, what will happen if I put my foot there, and then my other foot there, and then my other foot there. I'm going to imagine all the rewards, imagine I might fall over, imagine I might um, you know, get to my pot of gold at the end of this thing. Um, all the things that might happen, I imagine those, solve for my imagined experience by just applying reinforcement learning to those sample trajectories, to those imagined experiences. And it turns out that not only um, that we might have We've given something up, which is we've given up these probabilities, but that actually sometimes gains us something. It often gains us something. And it gains us efficiency because we don't have to consider that this breaks the curse of dimensionality. That, that even if we knew the model, even if we have the model in our hands, it's often a good idea to sample from that model because by sampling from it, we focus on the things that are more likely to happen rather than doing like these naive full width look ahead where, where we consider all events that might happen, even if they're low probability. <coughs> so sample planning. Sample-based planning methods are often much more efficient. We'll see examples of that. So let's go back to our AB example. So what, what would it look like here? So we started off with this real experience. We generated a model. And now we, we've got this model. We can use this model to sample experience. So we've got this model. So let's imagine now you know, that we could sample what happens. We could sample some trajectories from this. Um, the model should also include some model of where you start in this case. Um, so let's say. You know, we, we sample our first trajectory and say, OK, the model says I'm going to start here. And we roll a dice, and the dice says, OK, we should follow this 75% here. Um, and we end up with a trajectory that says B1. And we sample again. We find that we start in B. This time, we end up in B0. We sample again. We get B1. We sample again. We end up starting here. We get A0, B1. And B1, and you know, A0. B1, B1, B0. So we're just sampling from our own model. And it should be clear that the advantage of this approach is that even though we've only seen this number of real trajectories, that we're able to sample as many trajectories as we can given our computational budget. So we can sample, you know, if you've got a real robot, it's quite slow and painful to work with a real robot. But if it builds a model and imagines what might happen, it might be able to sample you know, millions of trajectories of hypothetical experience even though it might only have seen one or two trajectories of real experience. So that's the advantage of building a model. Once we have that model, we essentially have infinite data, <coughs> or the ability to generate infinite data. So now, let's take the final step. So the final step is to say we've, we started with our real experience, we've built a model, we've sampled experience. Now let's do the final step, which is to learn from our sampled experience and apply, say, Monte Carlo learning to these trajectories, that's the canonical model-free reinforcement learning algorithm. If we did that, we would find that the value of A, or what's the value of A over here, um, well, I started off in A here, I ran a trajectory and I got a return of 1. Um, started off in A here, ran a trajectory, I got a return of 1. So from this set of samples, we would estimate that the value of A is 1, and the value of B would be, I've got 6 trajectories where, where B led to a reward of 1, and, six and two trajectories where I got 0. So we would say the value of B is, is 6 eighths, or 3 quarters. Um, so we started with real experience. We generated a model. We sampled experience from that model. We solved 
by model free reinforcement learning um, to give us a value function. And that value function is, is different to the value function we'd have got if we'd applied it to the real experience directly. But asymptotically, if we run more and more and more, our model will get more and more accurate. If we generate more and more data from our model, we will ultimately end up with the right answer again. So, so it's a different way to arrive um, at a solution to the model um, to, to a particular MDP. Is that clear? Uh, no, good. Did you, uh, this sample experience, you based it, so when you say I start from B and I got one, does that mean that based on your previous experience there, the real experience? So we just used the real experience to learn this model here. And we also, the missing part, which is maybe what's confusing people, is the model also needs to include a, an initial start state, like some probability of do I start in A or B. So let's say that we right, have that yeah, probability as well. That's not my problem. Okay. The problem is here for one, two, three, six times from B you get one, and then one B gets zero. Two. Um, from this B you got zero, and from this B you got zero. All right, but isn't that a bit different because you start from A? Can you sort out that? Remember how we remember how we learn a model. Uh, oh, we so learn a model by one step supervised learning. All right, all right. At every state, we look at where we started. Mm -hmm. So if I start here, I start in A, and after one step, I get a reward of zero. That's my reward, the example for my reward model. Mm -hmm. And after one step, I end up in B. So those are the transitions we're learning from. We're learning from one step transitions. We're learning to build a model. So now that says, we just look at all the one step transitions from A, and if we average over those, that's just this one here. We've only got one example of that. So now we have to say that this transition should give us a reward of zero. Uh, uh, or we don't have to. This is the, the maximum likelihood model. You know, learning from, from this example, that is the model that we would do by the table lookup procedure that I outlined in the previous slides. Okay. And similarly for B, you know, we just look at the one step model. I started at B, I got the reward of zero, episode terminated. Okay. Going through all those. Okay, question. But how do we tune the number of episodes that we need to look at? Because if we build a model that, I mean, we might build a model based on a lot of central experience, but maybe our model doesn't not correspond to reality at the end. Right. So we need some sort of feedback as well. Um, so the question's a good one, which is how do we, how do we trade off um, learning about how much time we spend generating the model compared to how much time we spend computing with the model to sample experience? Um, which is a good question. And the answer, I think the right answer would be that um, typically with real experience, uh, real experience is often at a premium. So you kind of want to use all of your real experience and, and your robot is always generating as much real experience as it can. You use all of your real experience to generate the best model you can. And now you've got some, uh, think of it as an anytime procedure. Like you just keep in as much time as you have until you make your next decision. You keep simulating experience, generating more samples, updating your estimate of the value function, updating your <coughs> estimate of the policy, and at the time when you're, you have to make your next step, you just look up the best action from your, from your policy or from the value function at that point. So these things are, think of it, the planning is always going on. You, you plan as much as you can and planning is always going on. And acting is also always going on. You, you act at whatever rate you have to act in the real world. You plan at whatever rate you can think at. And you, these things just happen at their natural rates. That's one way to understand it. OK, there's a lot of questions here. Good. I'm going to, I think there was a question earlier. Um, um, yeah, yeah, I'm wondering about uncertainty in the model. Yeah. So in some states of the experience, we explain the uh, experience them much more often than others. Yes. So our estimates of what might happen from them right. are much more precise than in others. Are there okay. less yeah. inference or action that we take? Um, so I'm going to, so the, it was a great question. The question is, um, you know, what happens if we, if we want to take account of the uncertainty in the model? So there's going to be some bonus slides, which we won't get to today, on Bayesian model-based reinforcement learning, which basically says, you know, how do you, here we just made a maximum likelihood model. But what happens if you want to, you know, take account of uncertainty and say, well, you know, maybe the model looks like this, but really we shouldn't be completely confident of this transition being 100% from A to B, because we've only seen one, one transition. Um, so maybe we've got some prior that, that it should have been something else and we can combine our prior expectations with our, our data. Um, and so Bayesian model-based reinforcement learning lets you do that um, at some computational cost. And so I'm just presenting the simpler case here. Okay, I'm going to take one more question and then, and then move on. So I think, yeah, let's go. Just a simple question. Um, so you said that the model is 
for one. How do we get v of a is equal to one? Because we get zero from a, right? Um, no, we're looking at the return, remember, with Monte Carlo learning. Okay. So you start here, the whole return is what we are, we are averaging over. The whole return is zero plus one, if we're assuming this is undiscounted. Okay, last question, and then. Okay, good. Okay. Right. Uh, I'm going to move on, if that's okay, just so I want to, I want to move on. So, so what happens if our model is, is not right? What happens if, if we have an inaccurate model? What happens if we haven't seen enough data to really understand the true dynamics of the world or the true reward function of the world? Um, so we should understand that we will never, when we plan with this imperfect model, we, we shouldn't expect to get the right answer. That the performance of model-based reinforcement learning is only as good as the optimal policy for the model that we've learned. So we learn this approximate MVP with our parameterized um, transition dynamics and reward function. And now we want to know what's the performance that we can achieve in this world. Well, if we were able to just do a perfect job of the planning side, if our planning was, was optimal, we would solve this MDP. But the solution to this MDP might not be the right way to act in the real world because the real world was different to our model. And so we can only do as well as the performance of our approximate, um, as the solution to our approximate MDP in the real world. So model-based RL is only as good as the model that we've learned. <coughs> and so we should be okay with that, though, because you know, ultimately we, we're always going to be approximate when you haven't seen enough data, and it's just a different way to be approximate. And the way that we're being approximate in this case is by learning a model first and solving for that model, as opposed to approximating something else like the policy or the value function directly. Sometimes it's going to be better this way. Sometimes it's going to be worse this way, a different, a different route through the reinforcement learning problem. So some things you could do would be to use model-free reinforcement learning when your model is wrong. Like if we know that our model is just junk, don't trust it. Trust your value function or your policy instead. Um, another solution would be, as suggested, to you could reason explicitly about model uncertainty. This is the Bayesian approach, for example. You can understand that you're in a situation where, where you don't know about your model in one state. <coughs> OK. So. Are we okay so far? This is the sort of core ideas, model-based reinforcement learning. So, any last questions? Yeah. Can this be extended to continuous state and actions? Yeah, absolutely. So this can be extended to continuous state and actions. Exactly everything I've said so far applies, um, except that you can't apply table lookup methods. You need to have some way to generalize across states and actions because you'll never revisit exactly the same state and take exactly the same action again because it's continuous. And, um, so, so all of the, these model learning approaches, the normal case is that there's function approximation. You've got, say, some neural network representing your, your transition model, whatever it is. Yeah? Could you, could you give an example of the, uh, of the problem where it's better to sample from the estimated model and just learn the next and then to use the expectation? Using OK, so I already tried to give examples of that using the chess example. So, so I spent a little bit of time on that. So if it's okay, I, I think I'll move on. Yeah, I think, I think again, you know, let's think of games where there's a lot of MDPs where there's a lot of kind of um, sharpness to the to the value function, a lot of tactical decision making that needs to be made. That's very precise and depends very sharply on exactly the configuration. Um, could be some maze that's very different each time. So you take a maze, you randomly generate the maze, so it's different every single episode, and now. If you try to learn a value function directly, it's like you have to just look at your maze and figure out, well, what's the, right, what's the way out of this maze? That's a hard thing to do. Whereas to learn a model for that maze is trivial. It's like, you know, if I, if I move north, I'll end up one square to the north in this maze. Um, or if I move east, I'll move one square to the east, unless there's a barrier there. OK. <clears throat> right. So next section of this, we're really going to try to bring together now the best of model-free and model-based reinforcement learning try and construct something which is, has the advantages of both, pulls them together. So we're going to talk about these integrated architectures that, that combine the two elements together. And what we're going to do is we can consider like two sources of experience. We've basically seen two ways to generate experience now. We've seen real experience that sampled from the, the environment, sampled from the true MDP. So this is what happens when our robot's really interacting with the world. So it's the real world. You know, the real world is that you, you're in some state, you take some action, you, you see some next state. Um, and now you 
take some, you're in some state, take some action, you see some real reward. These are our samples that we're generating, our state action reward next state. Real, real interactions with the environment. But now we've seen that we can also generate experience in a different way. We can use our approximate learnt model, take our approximate MDP, and sample from that. We can sample states from our own model. We can sample rewards from our own model. We can generate states, actions, rewards, next states. We can generate this experience, these streams of experience, just by imagining what would happen next. By rolling forward our imagined model, uh, I was in this state, I, I query my model to say where will I end up with next, I query it again to say where will I end up in next, query it again, I end up with some whole stream of experience that I'm generating by interacting with my model. So we've got two sources of experience, real and simulated. Um, yeah, good. Um, it seems to me that everything you've experienced so far is just going to teach you to exploit what you've seen, and it's not going to teach you the benefit of exploration. Okay, so good question. And how does this relate to exploration? Can we learn how to explore? Um, so, do we, in some sense, exploration and exploitation, which there's a whole lecture on next week, um, is sort of orthogonal to this, in that you know, this doesn't tell you anything about, we're not saying you have to follow the, the optimal action according to what your approximate MDP is saying. There's nothing that says we have to just act greedily with respect to that. We can also choose to explore. But you're right that, that you sometimes also need to explore, and, um, and it's good to understand that, that you don't always want to act greedily with respect to your value function. And the value function in this case is arrived at by solving for your model, and your model isn't perfect, so we still need to explore to, to make sure that we start to understand the parts of the world we don't know at the moment. Okay, so we're going to talk about how to integrate learning and planning together. So the first slide of the introduction, we basically started off with this taxonomy again. Model free RL, there's no model, and we learn the value function or policy from real experience. Model based RL, where now we're considering sample based planning, it's an example. Uh, where we learn a model from real experience, and we plan by simulating experience from that model by interacting with that stream of imagined experience and learning from that stream of imagined experience. So what if we combine these together? Uh, we end up with something known as the diner architecture. Uh, so this is a old but fundamental architecture by Rich Sutton from several years ago, uh, where you learn a model from real experience, <coughs> but then you also so you basically, you learn the model from real experience, and then you use both sources of experience. You use both the real experience and the simulated experience to learn your value function or policy. So we basically use all our sources of experience. Sometimes we should trust the real experience. Sometimes we should trust the simulated experience. The Diner idea says, let's, let's just use everything. Let's integrate everything together. Let's use all the experience we've got and combine that experience together to give us a value function and a policy. So it looks a little bit like this where we've basically taken our model-based reinforcement learning loop, where we went from experience, learned a model, plan with that model to give us a value function, act with that model in the real world to generate more experience. And the thing which we've added in is this arc here, where we've now said that we, in addition, we don't just learn our value function from, uh, by planning with the model, we also learn our value function directly from the real experience in the real world. So we learn the value of functional policy in two ways. From real experience, just like our usual TD learning or Monte Carlo learning from earlier lectures, and also by sampling from our model, running imagined trajectories, and learning the value of functional policy from those imagined trajectories. So we've got those two sources of experience coming together. Let's exploit them both. Let's get the most out of this by, by using both of them. Question? If we have something like chess, where you have to make such kind of very long strategic decisions, wouldn't somehow using direct RL when you're estimating the value function from the experience that, let's say that that's going to give you something like the average reward given the move, wouldn't that somehow make the algorithm to do the tree search based thing a bit worse when adding that part here? So it's a great question. So the question is, does, um, does this arc sometimes make things worse? I've argued that there are cases where you should really trust this guy more than this guy, and so can it be the case that this makes things worse? Possibly, except that I haven't said anything about how you combine them together. So if you combine them together in a smart way, then you can basically make sure that you always um, make things better, because you can understand how well you're doing with, with this one, and you can understand how well you're doing with this one, and you can combine them in a way that, 
understands that you should take more account of the more accurate estimates of value. <coughs> so the canonical Dyna algorithm looks something like this. So this is the Dyna Q algorithm. It's the simplest version of Dyna. And all it says is let's just start off with some action value function Q and some model. And all we're going to do is basically use this very, very simple kind of model we've looked at. Um, and table lookup model. And we're going to plan with our table lookup model um, in addition to the real experience. So basically what it means is every real step in the world, we take a real action in the world, we see where we ended up, um, and we do two things. We do our usual say, um, Q learning update here, SASA update, where we update our action value function a little bit towards a one step look ahead of what happened after one step, our TD target after one step. So this is Q learning here, where we just update towards what we thought was the best Q value after one step. But we also update our model. So we update our model by supervised learning a little bit towards the reward that we observed and the state that we observed after that one step. So this is just updating our model in some way. For example, updating our table lookup model. And then in addition to this real step of learning, we have this inner loop. This is the thinking loop. This is the learning from imagination loop. This was our model free part. But now we can just imagine things where we just sample n different um, samples from our model. So what we can do is we can just start with some random state that we've already seen, um, sample some action that we've taken, and, and just sample this from our memory-based model. Um, and now what we do is we basically imagine that transition. We say, OK, well, now let's, according to my model, if I started in this state and took this action, I would get this reward and end up in this state. So let's imagine that transition, and let's apply a Q-learning step to that imagined transition. So if I imagine now that I would end up in this new state, S prime, um, then let's actually just now apply a Q-learning update to that to say, and update our Q values from where I started um, towards the reward plus the best Q value from where I ended up in my imagination. And if we keep sampling and applying this idea, then we can do better and better by just sampling different parts of everything we've seen, sampling our model, and, and improving it. <coughs> That's the Diner idea. It's the simplest version with a very simple model. Um, so what does it look like? So you can basically take some kind of simple maze environment like this. Um, and so we're starting in this state here. We're trying to get to this goal here. There's some grid world. You can go northeast, southwest. You know, usual deal. There's the reward of uh, minus one per time step. You terminate when you get to the goal. That's our standard grid world. And now, let's consider what happens if we use Dyna. And what we're going to consider is different amounts of thinking time. In other words, we're going to consider different values of n here, like how much thinking do I do? How much do I loop over? over these samples from our model? How, many, how much simulated experience do I generate in addition to the real experience? Um, and what we see is that if I don't do any planning, like if n is 0, if I don't use any imagined experience, this is our standard model-free reinforcement learning approach down here. Um, we get these kind of you know, noisy samples. And, and after, uh, say, I think this is the number of episodes down here, and after, you know, say 30 episodes, we've, we've figured it out. Um, but if we start to plan, if we start to do just, say, like five imagined steps for every real step we take, we see that we're much, much more efficient. We're much more data efficient. After just a couple of episodes, we've already figured out uh, exactly how to, to get to the goal. We're, we're sort of almost at an optimal solution already, which is down around 14 here. Um, so we squeeze more out of the data we see by first building a model and then using that model to plan. And then it's like we're imagining we might have seen some random kind of walk around here in our first episode. But that random walk was enough to tell us that from here I can transition to here. And, and from here I can transition to here. And when you put all those pieces together, you've got enough in your model to really now when you keep sampling your model, you can basically sample many, many, many more trajectories now and figure out from those samples exactly the right way to um, to move around this maze and, and get from S to G. Yeah, question. So I've actually shown them for the graph, but this, would it be the case that in step one on the x-axis, these would all start in the same place? Um, you mean do they all start from S? No, no, I mean on this graph, the I graph x-axis starts from Do they all start with the same initial yeah. 
um, conditions. And uh, so they all start with the same steps per episode. <laughs> and I think they would all... They all so, form the same. So, I mean, there's, there's some randomness here. So, so you can't guarantee that any experiment would be reproduced precisely. Even if you re-ran yeah. the same experiment, you might get different <coughs> values. But the distribution of um, scores that you would see would be the same. Like the starting point would be the same for, for all of these algorithms. So yes, it's not shown here, but they basically all start doing some really stupid first episode. Yeah. Because yeah. there's not much. Um, actually, even that's not true. Uh, even within one episode, Dinah can do better. OK. Um, In, not necessarily in this example, right? Uh, so, so imagine that, uh, imagine that we change the problem slightly, and we make it the case that that these are like, bad states that that you could kind of randomly go into and that really hurt you. Okay, but they don't. So, whereas the original problem, you can't even walk into these. Okay. If we consider that problem, now you would start off occasionally wander into these states, hurt yourself. Um, but you'd build up a model that if you're in this state and go right, you'd start to understand that that hurts you. Yeah. And now if you use Dyna, you would plan more efficiently to understand how to avoid getting into these situations where you end up on these states. Yes. So let, let's change it even more and say there's a little bit of wind in this environment as well. And with Dyna then, you'd learn quite quickly to avoid being close to these states because you would learn just from your random stumbling around, you would learn that you shouldn't be somewhere that's close to this because you might get blown into it. Mm -hmm. and you start to imagine all of those transitions that took you into that, and you learn from those imagined transitions. Um, whereas using you know, direct model free reinforcement learning, you have to experience these transitions an awful lot to yeah. figure out how to yeah, back yeah. up your values all the way through, and, 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 and you need, just need more data. So even within the first episode, even before your first episode is terminated, you could do better. In this particular example, there's basically no signal until you get to the goal. So I don't think there'd be much difference between them. <laughs> right. This slide is just to show that, um, that we can change the environment. Um, so we can start off in, in this environment. Um, we can basically start off, um, so again, we've got a grid world. We're trying to get from here to here. There's a barrier here. Um, and so now let's see what happens if, if partway through, um, we were actually to change the environment. We were to change it. So we would move the passageway from here um, to here. And let's think about what effect that's going to have on the dynamics of our learning algorithm. So, so what's going to happen? So we start off, uh, think eventually we, after some amount of learning, you know, we stumble around for a while, we start to sample transitions using our Dyna algorithm, we figure out this optimal policy here, um, and then all of a sudden things change, um, and we discover that we're in this new situation, what will happen? Well, we'll start off trying to stumble through here, um, and our model really thinks that this is the way through, so we'll spend quite a lot of effort getting through there, um, but we need to make sure that we also can now discover this new state here. Um, so again, this is where the exploration comes in that someone asked about earlier. Um, that we need to make sure that we continue to explore. So you can slightly modify the algorithm to have a bonus to make sure that you basically have a bonus for states that you haven't visited very much. That's this Q plus idea. And that encourages you to kind of explore around and very quickly find this change state so that you can find your way through and, and solve the problem more efficiently. Um, but the main point is that, that you know, after a while, when things change, you basically end up flatlining for a while. You flatline because your model is telling you to just keep going over here. Um, you're planning and you really believe that this is the, the way through. And even once you exclude that, you then have to kind of try other things again and, and figure out that, that there's something better. Yeah? Uh, on the left hand side of the graph, why does DynaQ plus rise more quickly? Because it explores more effectively. Because DynaQ plus has a bonus that helps you identify new parts of your state space and learn about your model more effectively. So instead of just stumbling around until it discovers this way through, it's got a bonus that encourages it to believe that states are better that it's never experienced transitions from. So it's kind of encouraged to, to go to new places and, uh, and, and get this bonus there. Um, and Sorry. we can also do the, uh, the converse, just one sec. We can do the converse where we can make the problem easier instead by making another um, we're starting off with this solution and then suddenly adding in an, an easier solution here. Um, but we notice that this one um, is easier for the algorithms to deal with because our model, um, assuming we've already explored this, um, it just needs to see, so it, it, it will already know about this thing. Um, so it will continue getting that, that score 
If you don't explore anymore, it will continue using this pathway through here. That's what these lines are here. But if you tell it to explore a little bit and encourage it again to keep revisiting states that it hasn't visited for a while, it will discover that things have changed and then it will get taken to a new part of the state space. Um, okay, one question and then I'll, I'll move on. I just wanted to know the QMP policy. It's basically whether there's a bonus for um, states that you haven't visited. That's it. It gives a bonus to encourage you to explore more. Thank you. OK. Um, so are we all good so far? I think people are tracking. Uh, the last section is really a different view on, on planning now. So what we're going to do is we're going to spend a bit of time. So we've talked a lot about model-based reinforcement learning. In this last section, we're going to back off to just one part of that, to the planning problem. You can still imagine that we're doing model-based RL where we're learning a model, but we're going to focus more on the planning part, how to plan effectively. And we're going to consider this idea of simulation-based search, where we're really going to explore this idea of taking samples from imagined experience, sampling our model to generate trajectories of imagined experience. We're going to push that further, and we're going to see how it can be used to make state-of-the-art search and planning methods. So, the key ideas that we're going to use are sampling and forward search. So first of all, let's understand what those are. So forward search algorithms don't explore the entire state space. It's not like, you know, so far with Dyna, we were basically saying, well, let's randomly sample transitions from our entire state space, everything we've seen so far. Here, we're saying, well, actually, there's one state we care a lot more about getting the right answer for, and that's the state I'm in right now. Now has this kind of special, uh, importance. You know, if I'm on a mountain and I'm climbing up that mountain, what I really care about is you know, what's the next step I should take on that mountain um, to get to the top or to get back down it. I really don't care about you know, what I should eat for lunch when I'm back home the next day. That's kind of irrelevant to me actually surviving in that situation. So the current state is particularly important. We need to make sure that we get the right action from that current state. And the way that we can do that is by forward search, by focusing on what's likely to happen next in the short-term future. Um, and so one way to do that is by look ahead. You start at the state you care about. This is, this is now, our state ST, now. Um, and we're going to build a search tree with this current state, this ST, this is our root state, this is our now, our moment that we're in, at the root. And we start to do look ahead, where you could do this exhaustively. You could say, let's start in this state and build a search tree that says, I could take this action, I could take this action. Um, the wind might blow me to here or to here, and then I could take this action or this action. Um, that might terminate the episode. This might blow me to here. Take um, you know, this action here, and so forth. You can build the whole search tree. You can look ahead. You can use your model to tell you what will happen next for each of these. And the model tells you, um, if I take this action, I could get blown here, or I could get blown here. We have the model. Um, and that lets us look ahead. It lets us look at this whole tree of contingencies of what might happen in the short term future. And the main point of this slide is to say that we don't need to solve the whole MDP. Solving the whole MDP is a big waste of resource. We just need to focus on the sub-MDP that starts from now. Right? You know, what happens in some unreachable part of the state space or something we're not going to reach for another year from now uh, doesn't really matter to us. It just matters the sub-MDP that we're in right now. Let's do well for that. <coughs> And sometimes that can be dramatically easier than solving for the whole MDP. So that's forward search. We solve for the sub-MDP starting from now using look ahead. Um, so simulation-based search is a forward search paradigm that uses sample-based planning. In other words, what we do is we start from now 